I do again want to encourage you to uh, share prayer requests. Um, that's just a passion of mine to be able to pray for you. Now, there is a distinct difference between being sorry you did something and sorry you got caught. If you're sorry you did something, uh, you're repentant, you're sorry for all the benefits you received and the hurt that you may have caused through your actions. If you're sorry that you got caught, you're just sorry for the consequences for what you had decided you should have done. A prime example of that is speeding. Most people go over the speed limit at least a little bit. So in general, most people break the law. Now, whether you're going a mile or two over is different than if you're going 25 miles over the speed limit. But we're all breaking the law. And so when we get caught, we're more or less sorry we got caught than actually we were doing it in the first place. And some people go to the extreme of having radar detectors or even radar scramblers, even though they're illegal, because they don't want to get caught. Their actions are driven by avoiding the consequences as opposed to what they actually should or should not be doing. But sometimes we can get overwhelmed or we can have, have different scenarios that cause us to do things we otherwise wouldn't be doing. <clears throat> And, and so sometimes we, we're in a bad situation because of some external uh, things in our lives. But we can't always just use those as an excuse. We can't just excuse away our choices. See, Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. And Peter is one of those people who was passionate. If there's one thing about Peter that people know or people agree on is that his passion was unquestioned. But his loyalty wasn't always where it should have been. In fact, Jesus tells all of his disciples that their loyalty is going to come into question. We find that in, in Mark uh, chapter 14, starting verse 27, as Jesus is going with his disciples, he tells them, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. He continues, Jesus continues, he says, but after I'm raised from the dead... I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. And Peter, the disciple, uh, who is known to uh, be bold, he tells Jesus, I will never desert you, even if everyone else does. But Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. Tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter emphatically replied, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the other disciples vowed the same. So that was Peter. He was one who spoke, one who would commonly make his voice heard. Now, as the story of Jesus' trial and crucifixion unfolds, we find that this actually is true. All the disciples deny Jesus, scatter, fall away from him, and go do their own thing. They're scared of what's happening, and so they go somewhere else. Now, Peter was the one who we hear or we see actually stand up and say, no, that's not going to be me. I'm going to stay true to you. I'm not going to deny you. So his passion is unquestioned. But unfortunately, his passion doesn't produce the results he wanted it to. Because as we continue on in Mark 14, we see that Judas betrays Jesus. And so Jesus is arrested and he is taken to the house of the high priest, Caiaphas the high priest. And there his trial happens with the religious leaders. But Peter is following. We pick up in, in, in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 14, verse 66. Peter was in the uh, courtyard of the high priest. And one of the servant girls of the high priest saw Peter warming himself by the fire. She took a close look at him and said, You were one of those with Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter denied it and said, I don't know what you're talking about. Just then the rooster crowed. When the servant girl saw him standing there, she began to tell others, this man is definitely one of them. But Peter denied it again. So here are the first two denials of Jesus that Peter gave. And we see in this situation, 
Peter is in, he's in the courtyard of the high priest. He is right outside where Jesus' trial is happening. So he's close. He's close to Jesus. And part of it is he's in enemy territory. Now, enemy may be too strong of a word as, as we think of what's happening, but the people that are arresting Jesus, that are trying Jesus, that are pushing to have Jesus killed, Peter is right next to them. He is in their territory. So Peter's probably confused. He's probably scared. He's probably anxious. He's uncomfortable. He is not sure what's actually happening. See, there's a quote by a guy named Kyle Eilerman who who says a lot of people want to be close to Jesus, but they don't actually want anything to call them to sacrifice. See, we want to be close enough to Jesus that will receive all the benefits, but not so close that it actually requires anything from us. I think that's where Peter was that night. He wanted to be close to Jesus, but he wasn't willing to take that step to actually courageously follow him. And I fear too many people want the same thing. We want to be close enough to Jesus that we receive something, but not so close that it actually calls us to change, that it actually calls us to make sacrifices or give things up for him. But part of, of, of the confusion and the fear that Peter may have been experiencing is the fact that the trial that Jesus was enduring was not legit. The religious leaders broke 14 different laws in their trial of Jesus. The trial happened at night. It was against the law. In order for someone actually to be executed for a capital offense, they had to wait an entire day after the conviction to be able to kill the person. They didn't do that. The religious leaders actually interrogated Jesus, which was against the law. So all, this, all the things are stacked up against Jesus. And all of his closest followers have abandoned him. So Jesus will die alone. And then comes the high priest's servant, a girl. We don't know how old she was. But Peter is afraid of this girl, this grown man who is a fisherman, who has been following Jesus for the last few years, is now scared of this girl who is a servant. He is not willing to stand up for Jesus. But we see this conflicted spirit that Peter has. He wants to follow Jesus, but he's not sure if he can commit to it. He denied Jesus. In this moment, we see that Peter is both attracted and repelled by Jesus. He wants to be close to Jesus. He is there. He's taking risks by being in the high priest's courtyard, but yet he can't fully get there. He's attracted and repelled at the same time. So essentially, the opportunity cost is what Peter is weighing here. So the opportunity cost asks, what is the cost of doing something versus what is the cost of not doing something? And in this moment for Peter, the cost of following Jesus was too great. He couldn't take that next step. So we have this first denial. The girl says, you are one of those who are the follower of Jesus of Nazareth. And, and Peter plays dumb. He denies and says, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. He, he tries to evade the question tries to get this girl off of his back so that she will quit bothering him and he can go on with the rest of his life and try to figure out what's happening. He doesn't need this extra pressure from her. But the girl was persistent. She didn't stop there. She didn't just have this one-time encounter with Peter. She, went, she was telling other people that this person, this Peter, was a follower of Jesus. Imagine what's going through Peter's mind. This girl comes and confronts him. He tries to evade and, and move on. And then she keeps telling others. So he's probably getting more nervous and more nervous and more anxious and more scared and more afraid. Peter had the courage to be close to Jesus, but not the courage to admit that he was a follower of Jesus. But take a minute and think about all the things that Peter did that we have recorded up to this point. Peter walked on water. Jesus came to the disciples while they were on the boat, and, and, and Jesus actually called Peter out to him, and Peter walked on water. So he has seen the power of Jesus in action through that. 
Peter was the one who actually confessed and articulated that Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. And Jesus gave high affirmation to Peter after that, saying that was revealed to him by God. We also have that when Jesus was arrested, Peter was the one who drew his sword to try to defend Jesus. Peter had all of these experiences, and we show that he faithfully followed Jesus. He wanted to be there. But this courageous man who followed Jesus for several years is now afraid. But a little later, some other person confronted Peter and said, You must be one of them, one of the followers of Jesus, because you are a Galilean. Peter swore, Curse on me if I am lying. I don't know the man you are talking about. Now, the context for when this is happening is Passover is, is getting ready to begin. Passover is, is a huge Jewish festival where Jews from all around the world would come and celebrate in Jerusalem. In fact, every Jewish male from around the world was expected to celebrate Passover in Jerusalem at least once in their lifetime. But there were several that made the pilgrimage every year. There were several that made it every once in a while. So there were a lot of extra people in Jerusalem. It was filled. Now, Galilee wasn't very far from Jerusalem. So there's likely that there were a lot of people from Galilee that were actually there. But one disciple, Judas, was from south of Jerusalem, while the other 11 disciples were from north of Jerusalem, which is where Galilee is. So Peter was one of the 11 that was from Galilee. And for whatever reason, they have some distinct dialect or some distinct characteristic that people could look at them and say, well, you are from Galilee. You are from this area. And Jesus' followers had that reputation. His disciples were known to be from Galilee. So for whatever reason, this person identified Peter as being one of the people that was a follower of Jesus. It had become too much for Peter. He couldn't stand it anymore. He couldn't evade. He didn't just have a casual denial. He didn't flat out deny it. He emphatically denied Jesus. He put curses on himself if he was lying. He was pushed into a corner fighting for his life. This courageous Peter had become afraid. Now, we're all imperfect. It's important that we recognize that no one is perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to stumble. We're going to have things in our life that we say, oh, I wish I would not have done that. Or we have past that we wish we could change. But the fact that we make mistakes doesn't mean that we should just condemn ourselves. Because when we get to the end of the story, we find that Peter found healing and redemption and forgiveness through the work of the Holy Spirit in his life. The Holy Spirit redeemed him and purified him from the sin that he had committed. And this third denial was a complete and utter denial of Jesus. But here's the thing. There's probably a good reason why we know this story. And it's not because the servant girl told the story. It's not because the other bystanders told this story. It's likely we know this story because Peter shared this story. He could share this story because he has experienced the redemptive power of Jesus in his life. So he could tell people, no matter how bad you are, no matter how much you've sinned, no matter what's wrong in your life, Jesus can forgive you. So as Peter tells this story, he can say, I denied Jesus, but Jesus never denied me. So I'm telling you today, you may have denied Jesus, but Jesus has never denied you. He loves you. He wants you. He wants to restore you. He wants to heal you. He wants to redeem you. He wants to make you whole again. But immediately after Peter denied Jesus this third time, the rooster crowed a second time. Suddenly Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you deny three times that you even know who I am. 
and Peter broke down and wept. Peter remembered instantly what happened. He remembered instantly that Jesus had told him he was going to do this. Now, the Gospel of Luke has an extra detail to this moment that is gut-wrenching. Because after the rooster crowed, it says that Jesus turned and he looked right at Peter. And I just have this image in my mind that Jesus and Peter make eye contact. And so Peter was just broken because of how much he had failed Jesus. Now, everyone who's been saved or wants to be saved by Jesus, we have to come to this realization that we have rejected Jesus, that we have done something to hurt Jesus, that we have sinned against him. Now, now we, we shouldn't be necessarily happy that Jesus had to die, but we're grateful that he did. We're grateful that he willingly chose to die so that we could have life. And Peter wept. He was immediately sorry for what he had done. When Jesus needed Peter the most, Peter failed. He rejected him. But we have to come to the realization that we are just like the disciples that we incline to choose our own path, to go our own way, to fill our own desires however we see fit. We don't want to be constrained. We don't want to be limited. We don't want to make sacrifices. We want to do whatever feels good or whatever feels right, no matter the consequences. See, we're all guilty of sin. Romans 3.23, the Apostle Paul tells us, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standards. So no matter who you are, you have sinned. No matter how long you have been a follower of Jesus Christ, no matter if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, we all have sinned, so we all start at the same point. We're sinners. But through Jesus Christ, we can be saved by grace. But I believe that Peter wept, not because he feared condemnation, not because he didn't like the consequences of what was happening. He didn't like the consequences, but I believe that his weeping, his sorrow, his repentance was because he loved Jesus and he realized how much he had hurt Jesus. He was sorry, not because he feared consequences, but because he had hurt somebody he loved. Now, we all have temptations. And temptations can overwhelm us in the moment. And I'm not trying to excuse us and say it's okay to chase after temptations. But the weeping that Peter displayed showed spiritual awareness. That he realized what he had done was against Jesus, somebody who he loved. Now a few weeks ago, Pastor Josh preached on Judas. And I encourage you to go look that sermon up. If you missed it, uh, you can check out our church podcast at B1NAS. But Judas was a disciple of Jesus. And he had agreed to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And so he betrayed Jesus with a kiss and Jesus was arrested from that. But Jesus, Judas, we find, was sorry that it had happened. He was sorry he did it. He was sorry he got caught or didn't like what the results were. In fact, Judas goes to the point where he actually tries to give the money back for his betrayal. He throws it back. He, he gives it back and doesn't want anything to do with it. See, Judas is distraught, but he's not repentant. He doesn't want to change. He wants the outcome to be different, but he doesn't actually want to change who he is. And so his reaction is after he realizes what happens, he throws the money back. He isolates himself and ends up hanging himself. So with Judas, we see that deeds of darkness deepen despair. When we live in darkness, it gets worse and worse. And the more darkness we live in, the more despair we have. The more despair we have, the more we're inclined to darkness. And Judas lived in that reality. And I believe that Judas did not intentionally seek to leave Jesus. 
He was not looking for ways to get out of his commitment to be a disciple of Jesus. And that's one of the dangers we have to make sure we are aware of. That when we're trying to follow Jesus, there will be many things that try to pull us away. And we have to be careful and vigilant against them. Peter, on the other hand, is repentant. He realizes the full ramifications of his actions and he wants to change. Judas left the fellowship of other followers of Jesus. Peter didn't. We find later that Peter was actually with the other disciples. So however that worked, they got back together. So Peter didn't reject the fellowship. He stayed with them. And with Peter, we find a core central truth that we all must believe no matter what our relationship with Jesus is. That repentance routes rejection. Peter had rejected Jesus. He had gone his own way. He had done his own thing. But yet when he changed, when he repented, when he came back to Jesus weeping, that rejection was washed away. So no matter what we've done, Jesus wants to take away our sin. And so we see with Judas condemns himself in isolation and he doesn't know what to do. Peter also didn't know what to do, but yet he found his way back to Jesus. So in this, we see that there's a reorientation that has to happen when we follow Jesus. That reorientation is not that we live by the rules of the world, but we live in the realm and reign of Jesus Christ. And Jesus wants to do that in your life. See, Peter sinned and Judas sinned. They both did. There's no question about that. There's no question that all of us have sinned. The issue is not that we have sinned. It's how we're going to respond to sin and what that's going to mean with our relationship with Jesus. Through the failures of both of these disciples, we're able to see different reactions to sin. The goal is not just for you to live this perfect life that you don't have anything. The goal is you to have spiritual awareness for Jesus. To allow him to come into your life and change you. Not so you get to get benefits from him. Not so that you get these advantages, but because you love Jesus and he changes who you are. So we're going to close with the song, It Is Well. And I believe that verses 2 and 3 were the verses Peter knew, but Judas didn't. It talks about the fact that Jesus deemed us worthy to die for us. And it talks that our sin is nailed to the cross so we no longer have to bear it. I don't know where you are today. But I do know with everything that I am that Jesus wants you. He values you and he died for you. He did this so you would not have to live in condemnation so that you would not have to live in fear or anxiety. But it does require that you give of yourself to Jesus. It requires that you take risks for him. It requires that you have the courage to follow him, regardless of where you are or what the cost is. Jesus died for you, a sinner, so that you wouldn't have to be a sinner anymore.